Hi, uh, I'm Robert Rickover, an Alexander teacher in Lincoln, Nebraska, and uh, Toronto, Canada, where I happen to be right now. And my guest is Imogen Ragone, an Alexander Technique teacher in Wilmington, Delaware. And we've got quite a little project lined up today. The first part, which I hope will be fairly short, is I'm going to talk Im Imogen through a series of directed internal movements. She's had, we did one on this a couple of months ago, and we've gotten some interesting reaction from it, some good reaction from it. But in the, in the last two months, um, there have been a lot of new developments. And so this is, this is a more advanced version than the one we did, and hopefully a better version. And uh, I'm gonna go through it fairly quickly and not explain too much about why the, the particular internal rearrangements that we're gonna be working on, why those are the ones that are interesting. But after we're done with this, then I'm gonna talk, we're gonna talk about how this process that we're exploring fits in with the Alexander Technique generally, how it fits in with some recent ideas that have come to the fore in the Alexander Technique, and just generally putting it in, in context. But for, for starters, we're just gonna start, I'm gonna talk Imogen through some internal movements that she's going to make. And we're gonna work with standing. If we end up having a little extra time, we could do a little bit with sitting as well. Everything that I talk about will work for sitting too, although the, the, the mechanics are a little different. And the, we're gonna use walking as a kind of a way of exploring the effects of this. So Imogen, after all that, welcome to the show again. And could you, We've kind of prepared a place for you to stand sure. uh, towards the back of the room. And just so our viewers know, I, apart from what we did on video last time, I have no idea. She, she has no idea. No. no, no, she has absolutely no idea what's coming. And in, in some ways, I don't really have a good idea what's coming either. Just although I have explored this with a number of students, I haven't done this in a kind of video presentation. So Imogen, as you're standing there, you remember last time we focused on this uh, line of running uh, the little indentations below your uh, earlobes create an imaginary line, and that passes right through the top of your spine. And uh, your head then can nod around that or rotate around the, the vertebrae just below that, C2. So we, we, we worked a little bit with a direct, using a freedom direction, like I'm free to pull this line back and even back in space. We did that sort of thing. Uh, and then shift it over to uh, just the direction, I'm free. And by the way, this, this explanation, this little uh, talk through we're gonna do does assume that you know how to use Alexander Technique directions. And if you're not too familiar with them, I will be putting a link to a bunch of podcasts all about them, the history of them, and how to effectively use directions. But I'm not going to go into that in any detail here. So you remember that previous thing, Imogen, where we work with just up here. There are three other places where I believe it, is, it can be very useful to draw ourselves, the front of ourselves, back towards our spine and even moving everything back in space. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna just quickly outline what they are. Uh, one of them is at your ankles, your ankle joints. One of them is uh, at your center of gravity, your standing center of gravity, which is about two inches below your navel. It's located pretty 
much or S1 or S2 for the anatomically inclined. And then the third, third place is at the bottom of your sternum, right where your sternum meets the xiphoid process, which is a little bony extension downward from your sternum right at that juncture. And that happens to be your, the center of gravity of you if you were sitting in a chair uh, of the part of, of you that's being supported by the chair. And I believe that that is a very valuable place to pull in as well. So let's explore um, them not in the, in the order one, two, three, four, say if one is the head neck relationship and four is the ankle joint. But I want to I want to start with number three, the overall center of gravity location. So you could you know you know where it is two inches below your navel. Um, it's it it passes right through your center of gravity, whether that lines front to back or side to side. And we've talked a lot. We've had a lot of done a lot of work with creating an imaginary arrow that passes through you and out, and then you can simply move that arrow through space and you get a different quality of walking than you might otherwise. We've talked about lifting that arrow and moving it through space. You've done all of that stuff. And we've had many podcasts on that. But we're gonna do something very different this time, which is, Locate it, once again, locate that arrow. And for those listeners or viewers, if the idea of an arrow passing through you is at all disturbing, um, you could use a light beam, a thought of a beam of light that passes through you two inches below your navel, front to back, maybe comes to a point at either end so you have directionality. Right, that, that would be a, a perfectly useful image to use as well. And what I'd like you to do, Imogen, is draw that point on, your, on the front of you that's two inches below your navel. I want you to draw that back towards your spine. Pulling that back, or I'm free to pull it back would be really the way to go. I'm free to pull it back, and now I'm just free. And what do you notice happens at that point? Right now you have pulled it back. You're just saying I'm free. What do you notice about yourself? Well, um, I think I'm in a little bit different place. Than I yes. Uh -huh. um, definitely there was a movement back as I went back and then maybe a little bit excess stuff, you know, as I did the coming back. Mm -hmm. um, and then with I am free, I've uh, got more of use in myself. And mm -hmm. stuff, but it, I didn't revert completely back to where I was at the beginning. Right. And that's, that's, that's the key point here, that you've made actually a fairly large change in yourself by pulling part of you back even not just internally, but even back in space a bit. And I think someone seeing the side view of you will see that rearrangement. Let's forget for a moment whether that's a good thing or a not so good thing to do. But whatever it is, you made a pretty big change. Using a freedom direction to make the, that change as smoothly and efficiently as possible. And then when you got there, you just said, okay, well, now I'm free. I'm not, I don't have to pull back anymore. I'm already pulled back. And you, there's a little shift when you do that, but you don't basically go back to the old way of standing. And that suggests pretty strongly that that new way of being has something going for it because your body likes it well enough to keep you more or less in that area with just a freedom thought. I mean, that's worth thinking about. So if you would do that once again, sideways to the camera, um, you're drawing that point on the front of you straight back towards your back. You're, I'm free to pull it back. 
free to pull it back, and now I'm just free. And now continue with I'm free and use the forward facing arrow or point to just move, direct you through space. You continue to I'm free and I'm free to move that arrow or that beam of light exactly where it's pointing. Good, good. And then at some point when it's your own decision, whenever you decide to keep walking, and throw all that stuff away and see what happens. What did you notice? Um, I noticed what felt like a coming down. A clunk downwards, yeah, yes. Not, th not that different, I'm guessing, from when we used to talk about lifting your center of gravity and then throwing it away, um, just as a kind of a... Uh, uh, preview of what we're going to talk about afterwards. Mm -hmm. I believe that pulling back is actually w more effective than lifting. I think it achieves the same thing in a much more efficient way. That's that's the short, that's, and I'll explain why later. That's my initial um, reaction to it. It's it's a gentle way to to get to a similar thing. Yeah, it's another way to get it, and I think it's a better way to get it. That's, that's just from my own experience. So that's a place right at your standing center of gravity that it might be useful for you at home when you're standing or walking or anytime really, just play around with pulling straight back from two inches below your navel. It's pretty easy to find that. And then you use a, use a direction, an Alexander direction to uh, color the quality of that pulling back. And then when you pull back as much as you want, just say, I'm free, or whatever direction you've been using, and just let things settle out. And then you got that arrow, the front arrow is pointing forward. It's pointing in exactly the opposite direction of your internal pull. You just Follow that arrow wherever you, wherever it's pointing. That's where you go, right? And then you could play with throwing or play around with throwing it away the same way we did. Now another place that I think is very helpful to do this is if you find your sternum, which is I'll tilt the camera down a little bit for this. Your sternum is a bone that comes down to about. Let's see if I can that here. You follow this bone down and you'll feel a little groove. You might feel a tiny little groove and then another little bump and then nothingness. That little bump is the xiphoid process which uh, originally was a little separate from the sternum but has been somewhat fused to it. But it's very, um, it's very important, and we'll talk about why later. But at that point, right between the bottom of, of your sternum and your xiphoid process, that's your center of gravity when you're sitting for the upper part of your body. And you could say to yourself, I'm free to pull that point back towards my spine. And pull it as far as you feel like pulling, and then just say, I'm free. And what do you notice? Um. <laughs> yes, <laughs> hello. <laughs> uh, well, definitely, again, there was something, and I think this is an area that I have a habit of pushing forward. Yes, most of us do, I think. That, that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it really sort of helped negate that. that yep. And did you notice that w when you shifted over to I'm free, you didn't go back to where you started? I don't believe so. Yeah. yeah. So again, there must be something about pulling that back that the body likes well enough to continue even if you're not continuing pulling it back if as long as you as long as you put out a freedom direction 
that would prevent you from doing anything that uh, uh, lessens your amount of freedom, right? It's interesting. So that's, that's, that's one that's, uh, that's number two. If, if one, if this is one, two, two's here, and then three is at your center of gravity. I'm gonna a little bit skip over the ankles for a moment because they, I haven't, I have to say, I haven't fully integrated them into my theory of things, but I do believe that pulling back at the ankle joint and the hip joint, uh, the not the hip joint, the cent, your overall center of gravity together is, is a good way to go. And I think you might just try that and notice if it helps free your knees at all. Yeah, and then you could just direct both of those forward and, and into a walk. And if you wanted during the walk, you could add bringing your that uh, mid torso point, the bottom of your sternum, drawing that back as well and, and letting the arrow in front of it point the way forward. So you have three forward facing arrows, yeah? As you, and you're just, all you're doing is thinking I'm free. Yeah? Kind of, uh, you know, first time getting my head around three, three at once. It's a lot to think about. Yeah. I don't think it would take long to get used to that. It doesn't take long, but I do suggest to anyone experimenting with this: start with one, do one arrow, one arrow or one light beam at a time. But you're going to very to start with. But you're going to very quickly discover that you can just add others as you as you want. Or you could kind of go right from one down to four on your own. There's just a ton of self-experimentation possible here. And um, I'd like to, as the final thing to show our viewers, and this will require the infamous hair clip. Ta-da! Do you want me a little closer now? Um, yeah, you could do this sitting. You could do this one sitting. And so people will have a really good view of the side of your head and neck once the hair has been i have got a lot of it these days. you got a lot you, yeah being in england they grew in in england right that must be what happened yeah this is just for this <laughs> it's not right that's good so we'll, we have a side view of imogen's head and neck and if you were to uh, perhaps even without looking at the camera, but just listening to me, put your fingers at those two little grooves underneath your underneath your uh, earlobes, and this time, um, be again be really clear that you're going to use a freedom direction to do this movement, and the direct you're going to you're going to say, "I'm free to pull this imaginary line." back in space as much as you can comfortably do and then shift over to I'm free and does that seem any different than where you started out yeah yeah and I, I when I do it, I often feel like my eyes are quite a bit further away from the floor than they were. Like I feel like my head has moved up quite a bit unexpectedly, although the amount isn't huge in terms of actual distance. I wasn't aware of that in particular, but I, yeah. I'm always aware of how my, I don't know, horizon line or where my eyes look is different from my habitual place where they look. Yeah, yeah. And um, so those, those are the four points that I suggest our viewers experiment with using a direction like I'm free or on this last one, you could certainly have used my neck is free. That would have been a nice one to use. Uh, a simple direction that, that, 
that guides the movement you're making. And, and you are making a movement, often a fairly substantial one, but you're doing it with an Alexander direction and you're, you're, make, you're actually doing the movement for a very short period of time. And then you're reverting to just pure direction. I'm free. And if you, I believe that if that movement has taken you to a little better place to be, a better relation, internal relationship, then the I'm free direction is going to keep you more or less in the same relationship as long as you can continue it. It'll, of course, over time, you'll forget it. You'll return to your old pattern to some extent, but you can always bring this back again. And I, I, I yeah, uh huh. And, would you with the head one? Would you like we did with the other ones? Might you have this going and that going at the same time? And anything you feel like doing, you can do. The beauty of this new system is that it's so new that there are no rules. I really don't think there are any rules. I think you're going to find when you start exploring with them that you'll just instinctively go to them when you're sitting in the car or drive, driving or walking. Uh, I, I, I would almost can't conceive of taking a drive or a walk without using these directions or even sitting at the computer right now talking to you. I could pull stuff back and free and be able to you can take your hair down now, yes. And I can be here with the camera. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's the basic uh, process. And I just want to make sure uh, that I've covered everything. Uh, it, yeah, I think, that's, I think we've covered enough to get people started with this. And I'm sure there will be questions. Please send your questions in post them on YouTube or on Facebook. And I, I'm, I feel fairly certain that we will come up with an even uh, better version of, of demonstrating this over time. But I think this is quite an improvement over last time. There's certainly more to do. And now I would like to switch over to what, what I guess could be called part two of this which is explaining a little bit where this idea comes from. And it, it actually comes from quite a few different places and how it fits in with general Alexander technique ideology. Right. It's, yeah, I'm quite interested. But also, when I was doing it, I actually was reminded a number of times of being... Um, under the hands of a teacher, uh -huh. you feel or experience a sort of coming back a little bit before you move forward or get out of a chair that's, that's, that's stopping the, the habitual pattern. Of yeah, I think this is a way to give yourself an experience that is a little out of your normal range of doing things, um, but giving you can give you you can re I, don't know, I hate to say reposition yourself, but change the relationship of parts of yourself to each other, and then you can you can continue that for a period of time with just the pure thought I'm free. So you get a really nice little dose of a, va vaguely analogous to being zapped by an Alexander teacher with their hands. And, but you're in complete control of it all. Um, yeah, I, I think this is very, my experience with this and the people I've worked with has all been incredibly positive. So I really encourage uh, viewers to, to experiment. But I do want to get into a little, uh, a little bit of his Alexander history here. So traditionally, um, you know, Alexander was very big on something he called primary control, which was basically the relationship between this whole thing, your head, and uh, depending on how it was framed, the rest of you or your neck 
or your head and your torso, your neck being part of your torso. In other words, what's going on up here is um, very much Alexander's primary control. And the, when the, the phrase, phrase might be your head's re, uh, releasing away from your torso, your head's moving forward and up and your torso is following or whatever directions you're, you're using. There is a tendency to think of the head and the torso as being units, uh, the head being a, a, a part of you that doesn't have much going on movement-wise internally. It's like this block that's on top of your spine. There's bone all around here, the brain's inside. And of course, and in fact, um, the anatomy book that I uh, had at, while I was on my training course in England, a very famous uh, a guy wrote it, and he talks about the cranial bones, and he says, well, yeah, uh, they, they're separate bones, but they all fuse together at around age 11 or 12. And the lines with, that would delineate the, the bones, where they are, are no, no more important functionally than a map of a, of a state that had various counties showed, shown by lines. Yes, this is county A, county B, and there's a line between them. But when you cross that line, nothing special happens. Right, so we know that's not true. And we also know there's all sorts of internal stuff going on. Our eyes are moving, for sure. And inside our brain, there's all sorts of activity. Our brain, brain is churning out cranial sacral fluid. There, it's like a little, fact, little factories up here. There is movement. So clearly the head's not a solid block like a bowling ball. I think that's pretty clear right now. As far as the torso is concerned, now everyone knows there's breathing and that's movement and there's digestion and elimination. But I think there's been a tendency not to think of the torso as a part of you that you could rearrange posturally. I don't think that's in the general Alexander world a thing. And of course, it is a thing in the Jean Del Massarero's initial Alexander technique stuff. And for those of you who are not familiar with that, I'll put a link to uh, some information on that. But he basically claims, and I think with some reason, that uh, Alexander was in fact uh, a Del Sartre teacher originally. Uh, Francois Del Sartre was a very famous French uh, professor at the University of Paris uh, Academy of Music and um, developed a system that involved these kinds of internal pulls and observing yourself in a mirror and so on. And one of the places that John Doe, when I took a few classes with him, emphasized was this uh, bottom of the sternum area. I, although I don't want to blame Jean Doe for this video. I mean, he, I think he thinks I was a pretty terrible student of his who didn't grasp the basic ideas. And I probably didn't, but I did get a lot of useful information from it. And why would, why would this point, and I'm just, Sure, you get at the bottom of your sternum. Why would that be an interesting point? Well, precisely because the uh, xiphoid process, which is attached to your sternum, has a whole separate bunch of contacts. It, it uh, drawing your xiphoid process in actually helps activate uh, the muscles of your, of your abs, the rectus. Uh, abdominis, the transverse abdominis, as does the pulling of your center of gravity in. They both tend to activate your abs and, and do what people who are believers in core strength think is important. So that's why that place is important. Um, now, let's see. Um, so these, these uh, places that I've talked about, the, the ankle and overall center of gravity and up here, they're all pretty obviously locations where 
there's a part of you that is supporting everything above. And that they, everything above tends to want to either rotate forward or tilt forward, has a forward bias. Your ankles have that. Um, they're really designed for walking forward, for example. I mean, you could walk backwards. It's certainly a possibility. But you can the structure of the system is very much oriented for people who are going to go in this direction. Right. And you could say that everything above your ankle joint should go forward and up. That's how the system is designed. You get down to you get to S1, S2, where your spine basically um, meets your pelvis intermediated by the, the sacrum. That place is also a place where the pelvis is supporting everything above it, and you generally want it to go forward and up. As you know, that's the bias in the system. And it's very obvious up here, right? That the head uh, would like to rotate forward and release up. And it's even obvious here at the center of your uh, torso area, once you start playing around with it, that that's a really good place to pull back. So that, that's, that's why these four places have been chosen. Um, that's, I wanted to cover that. I want to talk about, and obviously there are other places that you could pull back and you might say, well, why don't I pull back here or elsewhere in my body? And you're certainly free to experiment with that. But the test would be if you, if you pull them back and you shift over to I'm free, do you continue to be in that new relationship? So feel free to try other places, but I believe those four are the, are the key ones. And they all have certain, um, they all have certain little advantages like this one. Well, this is primary control and it has all the advantages of primary control and you're altering this one. The, um, the pulling back at your uh, bottom of your sternum, and your center of gravity is, as I say, they kind of help switch on your abs. So you're not just pulling back, you're switching on a bunch of other muscles that are pretty useful to you. And I'm pretty sure there's something at the ankles that's a good thing too, and I just don't know what that is just yet, but I believe there is. Um, now, I, the other thing I wanna talk about is what we've been doing is modifying our way of being by internal pulls done for a short period of time and then replaced with a direction. And that's not something that's usually talk, done in the Alexander technique, right? You know, you're not gonna learn this on a training course. <laughs> and uh, unless you're a student of Jean Doe's in which you will be confronted with multiple versions of this as your project. But it's not the general Alexander thing to do. And so uh, from, from our last conversation, there was at least one person that was dismissive because, as they said, the Alexander technique is a non-doing method, and this is certainly doing. Yeah. And I think that's a conf confusion about what the term non-doing means. Um, Alexander teachers would have no trouble working with someone who wanted to make a movement like a, an arm movement of the kind that a violinist might make or reaching for something at a, on top of a shelf in the kitchen or, or walking, which involves a lot of moving of parts of your body. I think that the, the thing that throws some Alexander teachers off is that you're you're saying, I'm going to rearrange myself internally. That's not something we usually think of doing. And, but as a movement, just as a movement, in principle, it's no 
different from any other movements we make, right? So I guess you could say if someone was drawn to rearrange themselves, it would be good to use directions to do that. And the test of the effectiveness of that would be, did the change continue even after you stop pulling it, but you continue directing? So I just, and I think non-doing could either mean true non-doing is you put out a direction and you don't do anything to implement it. So when you say I'm free to pull something back, you're not figuring out how to make it free. You're just saying it's free and you're relying on your body mind to take care of the details, right? Does that make sense from, from your experience? Um, it could, non-doing sometimes means not overdoing things. Uh, that's another possible meaning. But anyway, I just wanted to address that. Um, and then I want to talk very briefly about the future. Our future <laughs> as Alexander teachers. Uh, like where, where would this, um, you know, um, where could this take us? And I think the thing, the things that I haven't figured, I haven't to my satisfaction figured out certainly is the role of the ankles in this. I think that's, that's an interesting one to explore. Um, but I think the main thing is the future is going to depend on people exploring these ideas and, and sharing their observations. What did they notice? What, did, what, what, what were the experiences like? Were they good? Were they bad? Were they helpful? And what, what seemed to work well for one person and see what works well for another, that sort of thing. Right, I am, um, one of my students used the first idea mm -hmm. part of pulling back, um, infused with, direction to, yeah. to make sure she wasn't like overdoing that and like you say releasing any of that overdoing right um, but she's found it very useful in two particular places and one is driving which i think you mentioned right yeah <laughs> right and the other was she's on a long hike over several days a lot several miles every day and that she said really helps her kind of keep her going and not kind of get into the <laughs> um, yeah yeah well you know we did do an earlier uh show on knowing where you are in space do you remember that i had you place a hand uh oh. you close your eyes and bring your hand towards your chest mm -hmm. and just stop ever so shortly before you thought you were going to be arriving at yourself. And for most people, that place is an inch or two away from themselves. Mm. So I think we tend to think we're a little further forward than we are. We tend to inhabit this place in front of us. And drawing ourselves back is a really good way to deal with that. Well, it kind of brings you internally to where you actually are i think so sense, you know what i mean yeah, yeah. and it yeah and it, sort of because in, yeah in your mind or the way your body is reacting it's as if you are those two inches further forward than you are yeah and if you think you're further forward than you are then all your movements are going to be a little distorted Right. So anyway, uh, the other final, the final thing I want to mention in terms of sort of the future, I have found it very interesting to do a little uh, research on the topic of bow and arrows, shooting arrows with a bow. As a kid, I used to do that at summer camp. And there's, it's an interesting phenomenon because with your classic bow, you pull back on, you have your arrow attached to a string, you draw it back, you're bending the bow. The bow doesn't want to be bent 
And as soon as you stop pulling back by letting go, it wants to get back to its original shape, which means a dramatic um, forward movement in the string with the arrow attached, so the arrow takes off. That's where the energy for the arrow comes. Now, I don't think this pulling back in ourselves of the kind I'm talking about is a, a pulling back in order to get power to go forward exactly. I think it's more pulling back to give us a clear direction, pulling back along with a clear direction of movement that we can continue to pull back or to think I'm free and allow the pulling to continue as the other end of that arrow moves forward through space. So it's a directive technique. But I do think looking at a bow and arrow a bit and just exploring what's going on there in terms of kinetic energy and potential energy, it's very interesting. You know, bow, bow, bows and arrows are one of the things that made England great in the early days, right? Okay. <laughs> the archers, the, the long bow archers, no one knew what to do with them, right? That was a very British thing. It was a, it was a, it was a, a, a very important military weapon in the, back in the ancient days. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just throw that out as an aside. Yeah. It's very interesting because I've definitely worked with people in walking, sort of bringing them back before they go forward and and kind of over overplaying that almost, um, so they kind of really get the feel of it. So anyway, so I, I've got lots of food for thought and connections that I'm making and. Yeah. So, so any, anyone, anyone watching, please explore these ideas and, and, and send your experience. We'll, I'll be posting them on, I'll be posting this video on YouTube and uh, I'll be posting it also then on f Facebook groups. So um, leave your comments somewhere and they will be incorporated into our next show. Okay. <laughs> so, anything else you want to say before we? Um, no, but um, fascinating, interesting as always. Thank you. Well, thank you for for being willing to be the instructee, the guinea pig. <laughs> right. Okay. So that ends this.